Thank you for your phone call. Fayetteville, North Carolina, we ask you to be brief, please. I would like to see, say to this pro-communist left-wing administration and this pro-communist left-wing media that this is a damn disgrace. There's people getting mad as hell at Bill Clinton, and it's about time he gets off his ass and does something. Thank you. Mattery, Louisiana. Yes, I'm calling about the balance budget. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. I was a Democrat. I turned to a Republican, and I'm really proud to see what they're doing in, in Congress. I want my children and my grandchildren to have more. I don't want them to pay out bills. And I'm hoping they'll stick to it. And as far as Bill Clinton, he is a do-nothing president, and I'm sick and tired of all of this. And Leon Panetta calling him uh, a terrorist, I think that's a disgrace. So I just wanted to let you know that's my opinion. And I don't know where they're getting the polls from because everybody I talk to is against Clinton, and he wants this balanced budget. Thank you for your phone call. Shot of the House Rules Committee on Capitol Hill. They're expected to meet uh, shortly to craft a new uh, rule for when the new continuing resolution, the temporary spending bill, the one that uh, Speaker Gingrich and Majority Leader Dole talked about just a few minutes ago, all bills that go to the House floor have to have a rule establishing how much debate time, et cetera, would be allowed uh, when that, in fact, comes to the floor. Falls Church, Virginia. Yeah, I think the balanced budget amendment is a good idea. I just wish they'd get to go, get their thing together and let the government employees like myself and uh, the other 800,000 of us get back to work and do the people's business. What do you do for the federal government, sir? I'm a National Park Service Ranger in Washington. And what have you been doing uh, the past day or so here since? Uh, not a whole lot. <laughs> just uh, watching C-SPAN and uh, hoping that they can get their act together so we can go back to work and open the monuments up for the people that are coming to see to see the treasures that they uh, that we have the opportunities to protect and preserve. Thanks for the phone call. Meta Vista, California. Yes, um, uh, I'm calling on the budget. Uh, I'm really very sick and tired of Gingrich and Dole calling names and everything. This has got to stop. We're acting more like little tiny kids. They act better than the politicians are. Get your act together and let's get something done. This is sick. And I'll tell you another thing. You don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to realize we, I would love a tax cut as much as anybody, but we don't need it. How can you give a tax cut when you have a $5 trillion deficit and you're talking about seven years to even balance the budget? What's the deficit going to be in seven years? God help us. That's all I can say. Thank you. Gresham, Oregon. Uh, hey, am I on? Yes, go ahead, please. Very good. Well, I'm saying, you know, what are we talking about, a balanced budget? I want all my benefits. I want all my freebies. Let's charge it to that next generation. And I say, hurrah to the AARP. Gimme, 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 gimme. I'm in a greedy culture that wants to suicide itself, and that's great. I don't want a balanced budget. I want more benefits. I don't want to be responsible, and I want to charge it to the next generation. Hurrah, Bill Clinton. You are the maximum liberal Keep spending, keep spending more, more All benefits. All right, Cole, we're going to have to go here. The chairman of the committee, Gerald Solomon, has just gaveled in the Rules Committee. Uh, consider uh, H.J. Res. 122, making continue appro continuing appropriations for the fiscal year 1996 and for other purposes. Um, both the uh, uh, Mr. Livingston and Mr. Obi, I guess, uh, are not here. And we are under a deadline. Uh, the House is in recess. We're going to start at 630 uh, for the benefit of the members. And uh, I see Mr. Livingston has arrived. I have an opening statement. And, uh, on so uh, in just a minute, uh, I don't. The, Mr. Livingston, I presume. It's nice to have you, but uh, just uh, withhold for a minute. Uh, we are here to uh, consider the uh, uh, continuing appropriations uh, so that we can uh, keep the government uh, functioning. Uh, I will uh, at this point uh, yield to the ranking minority member and uh, reserve the right to, uh, uh, to make opening remarks myself, although I might just yield to my good friend Mr. Livingston. Mr. Moakley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but I think these meetings are starting to get a little bit silly. My Republican colleagues know that the minute they decide they want the government to start running again, all they have to do is say the word. 
we can pass a clean continuing resolution, the President will sign it, okay. and things can get back to normal. The, the political games are doing no good at all. 28,000 of American seniors and workers have been unable to apply for Social Security or dis disability benefits. This is on day one. 200,000 of American seniors have tried to call a 1-800 help line for Social Security and got no answer. 7,649 of Americans' veterans have been unable to file compensation, pension, and education benefit claims or adjustments. 781,000 people have been turned away from national parks and monuments. 99,300 tourists have been shut out of the Smithsonian Museums, the National Zoo, the Kennedy Center, and the National Gallery of Art. 45,000 Americans have not been able to get their passports, and 700 recruits have been able, unable to enlist in our nation's armed forces. Mr. Chairman, these political games are doing no good at all. All they are doing is hurting the American people and souring them on the political process. People look at this committee, they look at these partisan continuing resolutions laden with Medicare cuts and Medicare premium increases and education cuts, and they think that the Republicans in Congress are playing political games. And I don't blame them. I give you my word, Mr. Chairman, if you offer a clean continuing resolution through December 13th, Democrats will vote for it alongside Republicans. The President will sign it, and we can all get on with the business of running this country. But if you don't, if you insist on playing politics with people's jobs, if you insist on raising Medicare premiums and cutting education, then the government will stay closed and House Republicans will deserve every bit of the anger that's being directed their way. Mr. Chairman, I urge you, I urge my colleagues, again, stop the political games. The American people expect and deserve more. I yield back the balance of my time. Well, Mr. Moakley, let me... Uh... Let me say once again, and, uh, and I do get irritated when I, uh, when I hear those people who have created this debt, uh, who are listed as the biggest spenders in this Congress over the years, uh, complain about the government not functioning. Uh, you know, I'm going to say it one more time, we have a $5 trillion debt in this country, an accumulated debt, and the interest that we pay on that debt annually that is required to come out of the taxpayer's pocket is a large slice of the budget pie. It is $250 billion. And I just recall so vividly when, uh, when President Clinton sent his budget and his five-year projections to this Congress this past year, he added a, an additional $1 trillion to the $5 trillion. That's, that would have been, meant that five years from now, we would have had a $6 trillion deficit that my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren were going to have to pay. But worse than that, that kind of increase in spending, in deficit spending, would have spread that slice of pie from the large hunk that it is now of $250 billion, would have spread it to almost $350 billion annually. Now, what happens? It used to be $250 billion. Now it's going to be $350 billion. Where do you think that $100 billion is going to come from? It's going to come out of those funds that are available for the truly needy, those people that cannot help themselves. Now, should we allow that to continue? As we did back in the, in the late 70s when Jimmy Carter was president, and because of those kind of irresponsible spending programs, the interest in this country that uh, businessmen have to borrow went from uh, 6% up to 21.5%. The farmers in my district and the small businessmen had to borrow money at 23.5%, 2% over prime. And there is no business in America, particularly small businesses, that can stay in, 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 in business that way. Inflation went up to 13.5% at the time. Can you imagine what would happen if inflation were to rise again? that way because of irresponsible, reckless spending, that the interest payment wouldn't be $350 billion. If the inflation goes from 2.5% to 13%, you'd be paying $700 billion in interest. We are not going to put up with that. 
Now, let me just get back to, uh, to my good friend Mr. Moakley's statements to cut out this silly business. I don't think that Mr. Moakley is silly. I don't think the Democratic Democrat Party was silly. In 1982, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, and 91, when they attempted to leverage the presidents of the United States into coming around to their way of thinking. That's exactly what they did, Mr. Moakley, and without objection, I will put that in the record. So well, it is nothing new here. Oh, you can put it in the record. We are you don't doing. Have to put it in my pile. <laughs> we are doing exactly what you did to us, which was uh, reasonable because you were the party in power, and you had a very uh, the right to do it. Well, the what we are you... doing today, and my good friend Mr. Livingston is going to uh, going to explain. He's my good friend. Too. How we are bending over backwards to try to help this president come back to the bargaining table and sit down and put through this seven-year balanced budget. I won't go through the details. I'm going to allow Mr. Livingston to do that, and then we can continue this discussion further. Uh, Chair Chairman Yield, for just one comment. Well, just briefly, I will. Mr. Chairman, uh, you're criticizing the president for the budget that he submitted. Yes. I, would, I would remind you that Ronald Reagan and George Bush submitted budgets to this Congress that raised the debt, the total accumulated debt from $1 trillion to approximately $4 trillion. Now, they may not have liked it, and they may have disagreed with some things in their own budget, but they submitted budgets that, that substantially raised the accumulated total debt of this country during their presidencies. You, the gentleman is absolutely correct, because every budget that Ronald Reagan presented was followed by five-year projections that would have brought this country, uh, this, this government, into uh, a, a, uh, a surplus figure. Uh, and every single year, they rejected the Reagan budget the minute it got here, and they went ahead and they put in their other big budget. So you never could get down that guideline. That's what this debate is all uh, about. I, you're, you're we are going to, just a minute, we are going to stick to the glide path of balancing this budget no matter what. We will not back off. The vote that just took place on the floor downstairs a few minutes ago was disgusting. Because the same Democrats that have been yelling that this, uh, this Congress is not doing its work, is not sending the appropriation bills to the president, this Democrat party just voted overwhelmingly to defeat that appropriation bill. Can you imagine? That is hypocrisy at its worst. Mr. Livingston. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mr. That's Chairman. <laughs> yes, sir. I presume, Mr. Luther. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the uh, committee, and I appreciate your making time available for me today. And I, Mr. Moakley, I appreciate that clarion call to do the people's business, because have I got a deal for you. Uh, we're here to present one, but let me uh, preface it by saying, uh, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Frost, you recall that all of President Reagan's budgets uh, were, were declared immediately by the Democrat Congress dead on arrival right. and totally disregarded. And in fact, most of his attempts to cut back on spending were totally and absolutely ignored. And uh, the Congress turned around and, and ended up spending far more than he ever wanted. Uh, and that's what really is the essence about what the, where is, we are today. It's not, not true in the aggregate, Mr. Levinson. Well, it, it's, well. It's, it's certainly true in the principle and in, in the concept. And, and, you know, I think it was interesting that, that the press uh, was so willingly uh, uh, ready to cite uh, President Reagan as the bad guy in that dispute when he was trying to reduce spending and the uh, Congress was trying to increase it, the Democrat-controlled Congress. And today, the press is ready to say that uh, uh, the Democrat president, uh, Mr. Clinton, uh, is, is right on track and, uh, and side with him against the Republican-controlled uh, Congress, which is trying to downsize the federal budget and try to get us on a glide path towards uh, a balanced budget. The, the plain fact of the matter is, uh, in confirmation of what Chairman Solomon said, uh, uh, if we get on a balanced budget, by the year 2002, we will have spent $750 billion less than is projected to be spent on the last major budget that uh, the President has offered to Congress. So $750 billion over seven years is a substantial amount of money, and if that money is not spent, it means that a heck of a lot is not borrowed, and it means that the pressure on the interest rates is reduced, and if interest rates go down by two points, as expected by Chairman Greenspan of the Federal Reserve, uh, every American family will find that they'll have significant savings in sending their kids to college and, ra and paying their mortgages and, and planning for retirement. And, our and the economic prosperity of our children and grandchildren will be assured uh, far more than it will be unless, or in the event that we don't 
uh, glide towards a balanced budget by that time. That being said, I, I might also say that uh, for, uh, to, the, to those who would call for a clean uh, uh, CR, uh, we're here to meet your demands. We're here to give you a clean CR. But let me say, also suggest that for those who have criticized the last continuing resolutions, uh, that was not unusual. Uh, there have been 55 uh, separate continuing resolutions in the last 15 years passed by a Democratic Congress, of which 15 prompted some sort of budget confrontation, much like we're in today. And uh, not only that, uh, significant, significant policy issues were injected into those continuing resolutions referred to by Chairman Solomon, such as the Bolin Amendment, which affected uh, the uh, uh, communist Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and which cut off our, our attempts, uh, at least on the Republican side and, uh, and many Democrats uh, who supported us, to, uh, to give aid and comfort to the freedom fighters of Nicaragua against the communists. Uh, but th that was done by continuing resolution. And then we found just today, just today, uh, in digging back through our files, would you believe it, the entire Vietnam War was ended, ended on a simple four-line uh, amendment which was included uh, in the 1974 continuing uh, resolution for the appropriations of, that, of fiscal year 1975. Now, you know, that's a pretty significant policy statement. Whether you think we did the right thing or we didn't, uh, I think by that time all of America was probably pretty glad the Vietnam was over, uh, even though it uh, had disastrous consequences for this nation. Uh, but still in all, ending the war by cutting off the funding as a unilateral act by Congress is far greater in significance than anything that was tucked into any continuing resolution in the last few days. So let us not get too confused with all the politics uh, uh, and all the rhetoric that's been spewed around uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, that being said, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I am very, very pleased to testify before your committee on this joint resolution that would provide authority for most of the government to continue operations through December 5th or until the regular bills are enacted, whichever is sooner. The President has vetoed H.J. Res 115, the most recent continuing resolution, and much of the government, yes, has shut down uh, in the aftermath. But this continuing resolution, we hope, uh, will, if, uh, if passed, enable the government to get back to work. The House and the Senate Appropriations Committees are continuing to work on the remaining regular funding bills. We made significant progress today, notwithstanding the last vote on the Interior Bill. But we're working on those remaining funding bills in a manner that will allow us to present them to the President uh, for his signature. However, it is clear that, uh, that uh, many of the budget decisions will extend beyond the next few days. Therefore, we need to provide spending authority for those portions of the government that, which aren't covered by signed bills. The following are key elements of the resolution before us. The resolution continues funding, uh, government funding through December 5th, or whenever a regular bill is enacted in a law, whichever sooner. And that, of course, means that as the President signs an appropriations bill, uh, though all of the programs, agencies, and uh, activities under that uh, jurisdiction of that appropriations bill are taken off the table and enacted into law and would not be encompassed uh, under this uh, continuing resolution. The resolution provides temporary funding for the programs covered under, the t under 10 bills. Since three bills have been signed into law, military construction, agriculture, and energy and water development, they have been omitted from this resolution. And I know that all of you would be pleased uh, to know that we have uh, three other bills. Treasury Postal Service, uh, which uh, uh, went through the House today, uh, Transportation and Ledge Branch, already for the President's signature. All the uh, projects and activities in the 10 bills operate under a restrictive formula that provides rates that do not exceed the lower of the House passed bill, the Senate passed bill, or the fiscal year 1995 current level. That is the same formula that uh, was contained in the last continuing resolution. The, the resolution also provides that for programs that are proposed for termination in either the House or the Senate version of the regular bill, uh, or uh, the regular appropriations bill, or are significantly reduced in these bills, then they may continue 
They may continue, but at a minimum level, not to exceed 60% of the current rate of operations. That, likewise, is the same formula as was contained in the previous, uh, previously passed but vetoed continuing resolution. Now, this is down from the 90% level provided for in the first continuing resolution. All programs continued uh, will be under the fiscal year 1995 terms and conditions. The resolution continues the no furlough language that was contained in the first resolution. Earlier uh, early year distributions for programs that have historical high initial fund distributions are also prohibited. What that means is basically that uh, no agency or entity can come up and say, look, uh, pay us all, give us our whole year's allowance right now. Uh, that won't be uh, tolerated. Also, no new initiatives can be started. Sections, uh, section 123 of this resolution provides for the orderly termination of six specific federal programs. They are the Administrative Conference of the United States, the Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation, the State Assistance Grants from the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and the Rural Abandoned Mine Program. Uh, these are in addition to the elimination of the Office of Technology Assessment as well as the downsizing of the Bureau of Mines, which were contained in the first continuing resolution and are included in this version as well. All of that is identical to the second continuing resolution provisions, and uh, frankly, nothing's been changed therein. There are also additional items uh, in this resolution which uh, deal with hand enrollment for various future bills and commitment to a seven-year balanced budget. Uh, and I stress a commitment to a seven-year balanced budget. This continuing resolution keeps the government functioning while locking, us, uh, locking all of us into our commitment to that seven-year balanced budget. Mr. Chairman, this continuing resolution has four main principles. Uh, it provides funding at levels that are below the Section 602 allocation provided for in the budget resolution. This is our part of the glide path that will get us to the balanced budget by the year 2002. It also restores costly government furloughs and inappropriate program terminations. It does not prejudice funding decisions for the remainder of the appropriations bills, except for a limited number of program terminations that are agreed to by the President and it provides a climate that is an incentive for everyone to conclude action on the regular appropriations bills. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, uh, this continuing resolution is necessary to get the government operating. We're moving the remaining bills as fast as we possibly can. We're making very real progress, but of course we do need this continuing resolution. It is restrictive, of course, but it will keep the necessary pressure on Congress and the President to work out our differences on the remaining regular bills and get them enacted into law. And my only last comment would be that the significant portion, the significant difference of this bill versus the second continuing resolution is that in this bill there is no language affecting Medicare mm -hmm. and there is no language affecting drug uh, cancer uh, research or drug uh, relief. Uh, otherwise, the, the uh, continuing resolution is fundamentally uh, the same, uh, with uh, perhaps uh, more stringent language affecting the guarantee, if one can be had, and of course there is no guarantee, uh, but at least the attempt to guarantee that we will work towards a balanced budget by the year 2002. <coughs> well, Chairman Livingston, uh, again, I want to commend you for the, the work you've done over the last 11 months. It's uh, uh, it's really unbelievable, and uh, the uh, you know as um, as I was coming in to the rules meeting earlier, I uh, walked through the speakers gallery downstairs, and there were a swarm of uh, of uh, media, uh, written media people, and uh, they asked me what was going to be in the uh, in this continuing resolution, and uh, I explained briefly just what you did that. Uh, you know, it's going to take us through December 5th, that it's uh, uh, going to contain the uh, CBO language, which uh, uh, is the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, uh, their, uh, their technical assumptions, uh, and uh, that it was going to contain 
the language uh, that I had uh, drafted and put in your debt ceiling bill uh, earlier to this year, requiring the uh, the Congress and the President to work towards that balanced budget in seven years. And uh, uh, I said, what do you think about that? And they said, are you really going to offer that to the President? They said, he would have no reason not to assign it. And I said, that's right. And then as I came up, uh, this elevator is not working uh, because it's run by a non-essential employee. So we had we walked around this way. And as I was coming up the stairs, there were a group of uh, visitors coming out of the gallery. And uh, I didn't know where they were from. It turns out that they were from uh, an area in North Carolina. And uh, so I said, wait a minute. Let me, and they were on the stairs, you know, and they were lined up. I said, uh, let me tell you what we're about to do. And uh, they said, well, who are you? And I told them who I was. I was this congressman from up in the Adirondack Mountains in New York State. And I said, uh, let me, you've been re hearing a lot and reading a lot about, uh, you know, this, uh, this sort of gridlock that's taking place. I said, what do you think about this? And they said, well, is that really what you're going to send to the president? I said, yes. They said, well, by golly, he ought to sign that in a minute. You know? So I think that speaks for the for what this, uh, this, Gentleman this resolution Neil, really does. I think when the American people I understand the issues and how we are framing it in this CR, they're going to see no reason whatsoever, other than perhaps politics, that the president wouldn't sign this bill. Gentleman Neal. Mr. Moakley. Uh, I recommend you give the pollsters these people's names and address, but that, evidently they're missing their, their knowledge. Well, I'll tell you, I've got a list of them on my desk in there. Um, I had over 300 calls uh, in my district offices today stretching over about 200 miles in length up and down the Hudson River and the Hudson Valley. And uh, it's a district that's about 45% Republican. But 10 to 1, they said, don't give in. You stick to your guns. Balance that budget, Jerry. What plan yeah. was that on? Huh? <laughs> You'll find out, my friend. And I'll be writing back to each one of them and thanking them for sticking up for America. Mr. Uh, Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say that I'm extraordinarily impressed that you're able to accomplish so much. I was with you on the House floor when you uh, were headed up here, and you had a meeting with the press corps. You met with North Carolinians, and uh, it's now 629, and the House is reconvening, and I look forward to balancing the budget, so let's go for it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Buckley. Uh Well, I gave my opening statement, uh, you know. Mr. Bielinson. <laughs> I, uh, I, I was shut, Excuse me, I thought I've you been were... shut off in the middle of sentences before, but never in the middle of syllables. Uh, I understand where you're coming from, and I'll just have to oppose you. That's it. Mr. Goss. I just wanted to be clear that in, in the seven-year balance budget, it's still CBO that's doing the scoring. Uh, that's correct. We have specific language uh, that, that takes the president up on uh, his, uh, his suggestion a year ago when he said that the, the Congressional Budget Office is really the only true arbiter of, uh, of the budget numbers. And therefore, he, a year ago, he had implicit faith in the way they scored the budget. And so we, uh, we are uh, uh, saying in this legislation that, of course, it, wor working any plan to work towards a seven-year uh, balanced budget would have to be sanctioned by the Congressional Budget Office. And the second uh, CR that uh, was vetoed recently by the president and has caused the problem that we're having now, um, what was the expiration date of that? Uh, that was uh, uh, November uh, 28th, I believe. Uh, December what? December 1st. I'm so sorry. we've extended this till December 5th. Five uh, on this one, which should, in your estimate, give us enough time to work out the other appropriations? I, I think so. Of course, if we run into more incidents like we did with the interior bill, we, we might have to uh, readjust, but I, I hope that that's not going to happen. Yeah, I would agree there are solutions for that. Uh, thank you very much and congratulate you for your leadership. Is there a time that's expected to get this back to the president? Uh, I, I have every reason to expect that we will get this to the president this evening. That would be wonderful. That is great. Mr. Bielinson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Well, you folks are, are anxious to balance the budget, and so are many of us. And as, as we understood it, that actually was your, your, your plan, your guide path was to be voted on and will be voted on sometime, I guess, on Friday. We're still dealing here with the continued, continuing resolution dealing with this coming year's appropriations bills, which is a little bit different, but nonetheless. I also just want to say, uh, you know, only because you, you chaps are a little overwrought to begin with, I don't blame you one bit. I mean, you know, it's, this is difficult. It's difficult to govern. I mean, now that you have the majority, it's difficult you've discovered. Now, you should feel sorry for us and the, all the difficulties we had in the past. But anyway. We're ecstatic. Right. <laughs> well, uh, 
there's plenty of blame to go around for the fact that the bu budget hasn't been balanced for a good many years, you know, from, from both sides. And the truth of the matter is, without putting blame anywhere, in particular, to remind people that every single year that Mr. Reagan and Mr. Bush were president, this Congress appropriated less money than either of those gentlemen asked us to, um, whatever the reasons. I mean, but as I said, there's plenty of blame to go along, to go around, and many of us salute the fact and commend the fact that you all are serious about getting the budget in balance this year. We hope to help you do it. We hope to help you do it in a, what we think is a more wise and reasonable way than will be found in your bill on Friday. But nonetheless, that is a beginning, and you deserve a lot of credit for that. But right here, we're still talking about the appropriations bills we haven't yet been able to pass, often, you know, often because of your, your own problems between Republicans in this House and Republicans over in the Senate, because often, not always, of extraneous legislative matters that have been inserted at the insistence on some of your folks, especially in these bills. So just, just so that people understand that, and mm -hmm. hopefully we'll resolve this in the next short while and get on with the, with the seven-year, whatever it is, guide path on whoever's figures. Good. Thank, thank you. Mrs. Price of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Chairman Livingston. Um, once again, you work so hard around here, and we appreciate it so much. Uh, I, I believe that this is um, a great chance for us to get together with the President and come to an agreement finally. Uh, I do believe that the President will have a lot of support from the other side of the aisle and all the folks over there who believe that this uh, budget should be balanced and the, those who have supported it and voted for it in the past. And so, uh, you know, I just I ask them to help us uh, get this done and get these folks back to work and get the government back uh, up and running. And uh, I believe we have a very good vehicle to do it here. Thank you for your Thank time. you. If I might reply, Ms. Price, uh, I, I agree with you. And let me say that, that I have heard, and I've not spoken to any that have, have agreed, but I have, I've heard uh, of conversations tonight uh, between uh, Republicans and Democrats in which de Democrats have indicated a strong interest in this bill and a willingness to vote for it. Now, we will see what happens when, when we hit the floor. But it would be my hope that... Uh, Many Democrats would uh, appreciate that this is a real solid step towards a balanced budget and uh, that they will support it in order to get the government continued to be funded and also get the commitment for a balanced budget on, uh, on record. Well, we all have an interest in seeing that happen, so um, good luck. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Frost. Um, Bob, I would like you to comment, if you would, on the statement uh, made by the speaker today that's been widely reported in the press. Uh, the speaker said that uh, he didn't care if the government was closed down for three months because uh, he had to get off the back of the Air, of Air Force One after the trip to the uh, Middle East. Uh, it seems to me the speaker's being somewhat of a crybaby. Uh, well, Mr. Pross, I, I would, I would hope that that's, that, that uh, uh, remark, as you've taken it, uh, is, is out of context. I, I don't know what the speaker it's being, said. being uh, widely reported in the press today. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I think, I think that... In fact, the Speaker of the House and the majority the leader of the Senate were a little bit concerned that the President spent 26 hours with them on the same plane and spoke with them for about 30 seconds. Uh, and, and I don't blame them because there was a good opportunity where they, nobody could go anywhere, where they could sit down and really talk about the differences uh, and about the uh, possibility of coming together to, go, to govern this country. Uh, but regardless, uh, uh, whether well, the speaker said that or not, I can only say that that we're not here out of personal animosity or spite or any for any other reason other than uh, the overwhelming percentage of our conference, and I think a lot in your conference, uh, believe very strongly that the future of this country depends on us balancing this budget. And if we can uh, somehow, as ugly as this process might be, get through it and put ourselves firmly on the path to the balanced budget, our children and our grandchildren will prosper because of it. Well, Bob, I agree with you. And I'm really, uh, I was on that trip. Uh, I was in the congressional delegation. And it, uh, it seems to me that there has been a lot of unnecessarily whining on this point. I mean, that was a very solemn occasion. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who was a, a personal uh, friend of the president's and who was a very courageous man, had been assassinated in a very a brutal act. And quite frankly, the president was, uh, 
was somewhat disturbed, as were a lot of us who were on the trip, by what had happened. And the pres on the trip over, the president uh, devoted his time to preparing his remarks uh, at, the, at the funeral, uh, representing our country, and I think he spoke very appropriately. And uh, on the way, I will tell you this, we were gone for about 43 hours. We were on the ground for a total of 12 hours. We were in the air the rest of the, the, rest of the time. Everybody was exhausted from that trip. And I think it's wrong to fault the president because of on a very solemn occasion, one involving a terrible act that he did not uh, engage in negotiations on the well, budget. I, I, I just, uh, I, I found that to be, those comments to be very, very uh, uncalled for. I, I would have to look at the context. I was not on the trip. I was invited and I wanted very much to be there and could not make uh, uh, the connections from New Orleans to, to in time to get on Andrews Air Force Base uh, to fly out. But I have to tell you that uh, I don't think anyone uh, in the Congress uh, inclusive of the speaker uh, uh, denies that that was a solemn occasion and that the entire world has lost a, a truly valiant and, and great leader. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a tragedy indeed uh, to see uh, yeah. Mr. Rabin shot down and, and all of our hearts go out to his family and to the people of Israel. Uh, and, and frankly, I just hope that the peace process hasn't suffered any uh, uh, in the interim. Hope, uh, perhaps maybe it, it is uh, it, it, well, maybe it won't be as in much jeopardy, but uh, at any rate, I think that uh, Mr. Rabin was indeed one of the great leaders of our time. And I don't think anybody wishes to stand uh, on, on that event uh, for political posturing. Yeah. But when you have three of the top leaders of this country in close proximity for 26 hours and, and with all of the bad problems that have been looming uh, and have actually occurred, in the aftermath, it would have been nice if they'd had an opportunity just to sit down and, and, and establish a framework for discussions. And it's unfortunate that that didn't happen. I think what we uh, we really need to be talking about the substance at this point, and not who talked to who or who didn't talk to who on that trip. And the substance is very important. Uh, we all want to balance the budget. We have some legitimate differences on how you arrive at that uh, that combination, how you arrive at a balanced budget. Uh, I voted uh, uh, for a constitutional amendment to require a balanced federal budget. Uh, I voted for that on several occasions now, was proud to vote for that. I want a balanced budget. We have legitimate policy differences on how we achieve that, and we're only trying to find a format and a form where we can resolve those legitimate policy differences. Hopefully this, uh, this bill will inspire everybody to come together, so I hope you, you'll vote for it. Uh, well, that, uh, wait just a moment. I'd uh, like to Jim withhold for a minute. Uh, you know, I, um, I personally resent, and I uh, resent as the chairman of this committee, uh, comments that uh, the speaker is whining uh, and that, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Livingston's being here is uh, the very reason that, uh, that Newt Gingrich, our speaker, uh, is trying to move uh, this Congress towards getting the government back working. And uh, uh, to uh, make those statements that the gentleman uh, just made, I think, uh, is out of line. Uh, I've already stated my feelings about Mr. Rabin. He was a close friend of mine, too. And I've met with him on many, many occasions. So I don't have to go into that. But again, uh, the very fact that uh, the president did not see fit to meet with Mr. Dole or Mr. Gingrich during those 25 hours in the air, uh, I think, was wrong. And it would not have shown uh, a lack of disrespect uh, for uh, Mr. Rabin had he uh, come back and met with them or invited them up to uh, his compartment in Air Force One. Uh, everybody knows that there were other people going in and out. That there were, uh, people were jovial at times, so it wasn't a case of people being uh, in remorse, uh, in deep remorse during that 25 hours. Uh, and it would not have shown a lack of respect had they met. I think it was, uh, it was wrong for them not to have gotten together. We might have solved all of these problems in that 25 hours. Mr. 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 Chairman, I'd be glad I, to yield to my friend. As I said, I was a part of that delegation. And I there know were you were. Democrats and Republicans on that delegation. And everyone on that delegation, uh, regardless of party, was very disturbed yes, by they what were. had happened, by the events that had happened. I was personally very disturbed by it. Yes, if I had been in the President of the United States, I don't think I would have wanted to talk about other matters uh, oh, while I was going to and from that funeral. Right. That was an emotional event. Anyone who saw that on television. And Mr. Who, Frost, now that's all well and good to say, but do you mean to tell me on the plane that you were on that 
sitting there with, uh, with 70 or 80 people that you didn't talk business or talk about other things now, that just isn't true. I happen to know the people who were on that trip. I know Mr. Livingston. I know that everyone was talking business on that trip about the problems facing this Mr. country. Mr. So Mr. Chairman, we can I carry can, this a little too Mr. far. Chairman, I know your personal I, feelings. You, you, you asked me a question. That's and right. I can tell you that uh, the people that I was with uh, did not discuss uh, business of the country on that trip. Uh, it was, uh, we talked a lot about uh, the peace process. We talked a lot about our personal feelings and remembrances well, of the Prime Minister. We talked a lot about the, uh, the, the ceremony itself. Uh, there was not any business conducted uh, on that trip. Well, uh, I've said my piece. Well, gentlemen, you Mr. Goss. Thank you very much. I, again, getting back to the substance, uh, Mr. Frost, you, you, I believe, mischaracterized, I'm sure inadvertently, the Speaker's remarks today. My understanding of what the Speaker said was when he was asked that there was always the possibility this thing could last as long as three months. He hoped that wasn't so. I believe you characterized it to say he wanted it to last three months. Is that what you said? Did, that he didn't care whether it lasted three months because he was insulted by his by the way no, he was treated. I don't that. I, could you tell me the exact words? No, the I don't said? have the exact words, well, but I, I, I just know that it's been widely reported. Okay, I wish you wouldn't mischaracterize that because I, I think that that is clearly erroneous from the report I have heard, and I don't think it serves the purpose we're trying to accomplish, which is a bipartisan solution to a critical problem for our nation. Well, Bob, uh, the very reason that you're here, I think, uh, is proof that uh, the Speaker Gingrich wants to get this government running. Uh, I think uh, enough is, is said there. You have a very good proposal before us. Let's get it down on the floor. Let's pass it and let's send it to the President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to salute you and all the members of the committee for the tireless uh, work that you do. Uh, you, you guys are here uh, whenever we need you, and uh, we appreciate all your hard work. I beg your pardon. Uh, are there other uh, questions from the, with the witness. If not, Bob, thank you very much. We'll see you down on the floor in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Sorry, I tried to recognize you. I That's didn't all right. You First of all, I, Mr. Livingston, I, and, and I think this is especially true when you get outside of Washington. Anymore, people out there think talk's cheap. They don't believe Congress anymore. Uh, after 40 years of this kind of fiscal insanity and 20-some years since we balanced the budget, when we have people up here that say, well, we want to balance the budget too. If you're serious about balancing the budget, then I think we should support exactly what you're saying, and that is give the people of America a time certain. And if we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? We can use the buzzwords, which I think are all put together by the political organizations like whining and, and so on and so forth, and divert from the real heart of the matter. But the heart of the matter is the American people want they demand, and frankly, I think they're entitled to a time certain that that budget is going to be balanced. Otherwise, this Congress, the last several Congresses, just don't carry much credibility. And I fully support, Mr. Livingston, uh, what you're doing because you've got a time certain. It's a reasonable time, and it's on numbers by the CBO, which is a neutral outfit, which are good numbers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McKinney. Bob, thank you very, very much for coming. Um, Mr. Obey, uh, we were going to call you up with Mr. Livingston, but as long as you have arrived, you're welcome to come and testify. You may feel free to summarize, and your entire statement would appear in the record without objection. Mr. Obey. <laughs> well, people here haven't been without uh, things to say lately. Yeah. Would you put on your microphone, uh, David, please? Just right in front, just push a button. Thank you. Technology, how about this? Yes. Let me say, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I am very disturbed by this entire process. And I very, I love this institution. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not thrilled to simply walk by this Capitol and look at the dome and think of what it is that we're expected to do here. And I think what we're expected to do here is to try to solve problems and bridge differences. I don't think that uh, that job is done very well. When we play a game of uh, let's put them on the spot, 
and that's what I think is happening here. Uh, I used to chair, and I am now the ranking Democrat on the Appropriations Committee. That is not the Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over the debt ceiling. It is not uh, uh, the Budget Committee, which has jurisdiction over the Reconciliation Bill, in which we are supposed to be debating these extraneous issues which have been attached to the appropriations process here. And at this point, the entire government has been shut down simply because uh, uh, we have uh, a desire clearly on the part of the leadership of the majority party uh, to gain leverage on their coming fight on the reconciliation bill by destroying the appropriations process, which is the process meant to keep the people's government in business. Uh, we can have all of the debates we want about whether uh, the budget ought to be balanced five years, seven years, ten years. Um, but those debates do not belong in the appropriation process. The appropriation process is an annual process. We're, we're now uh, being asked to muck that up by making yet another multi-year promise which I guarantee you will be broken just as fast as the other multi-year promises were. We have gone through now, I mean, we're, we're being asked now to, to promise to the American people that we will pass something which guarantees a balanced budget in seven years. My problem is I'm Irish, and that means I'm skeptical. And I've had enough experience around here to know that these multi-year promises never deliver. We were told in 81, when uh, the, the uh, Reagan budget was before us, that if we just passed that budget, it would be balanced in four years. It was passed. Donald Reagan, the President's uh, 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 Secretary of the Treasury, when a national television said, this is our program. It is now in place. And you know what? That grand promise to get to a zero deficit in four years only missed by about $200 billion. Something called an economic recession got in the way. And then uh, what happened is Congress then made another promise of a multi-year nature. They passed Graham Rodman one. That was a promise to balance the budget in five years in nice, neat, incremental reductions of $36 billion a year. And you know what? They only missed the target by $300 billion. So then we had Graham Rudman II, another promise, going to balance the budget in, I've forgotten the timetable, was it five or seven? Doesn't matter. The public concluded a long time ago they were all public lies, and they were right. They weren't meant to be public lies, but they turned out that way. Because they're all based on some bureaucrats' assumptions that never match the real world. And they were always also, in my view, politically driven. And so now we're being asked to uh, buy a product which says, OK, we're going to reach a balanced budget in seven years. I have some questions about this. Uh, I'd be very happy to, to tie down a seven-year uh, time frame or any other time frame that you wanted to mention for a balanced budget, provided that we have answers to some of these questions. Number one, how are we going to measure that deficit? The president was quoted, and I counted it, the president was quoted seven different times in the last two days, at least while I was on the floor, and I was off the floor some of the time in other meetings. But seven different times I heard the president quoted as saying he promised a balanced budget in five years. He promised a balanced budget in five years during the campaign if we had a capital budget. What he said was that if we did not, then on a unified budget basis, he would be willing to promise the country that he would cut the deficit in half in the four years that he served as president. He has largely already done that. 
And I think we can take some credit for it, Be at least those of us who supported uh, the economic program or those who took other actions to help along the way, even if they didn't support that. Because that budget was projected to be $327 billion by President Bush in his last official estimate before he walked out of the uh, White House. Uh, that's what he told us the deficit was going to be, and it's now down to $164 billion. Now, that ain't perfect, but that ain't bad either. And yet now we're, 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 we're being told, okay, we've held the American people hostage. We can now release them if we'll make another multi-year promise. Does anybody on that side of the table really believe the American people are going, are going to believe that promise? I don't think they are. I wish they would. Uh, but in order for them to do it, we're going to have to be doing real things. And, and at this point, when I look at the text of this, which I received uh, just a very short time ago, about uh, uh, half an hour ago, um, uh, it says that we're going to base these assumptions uh, we're going we're gonna to reach a balanced budget based on the assumptions of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Well, uh, I've got a problem with that. Uh, they just, if you take a look at what happened in the last quarter, they missed the real economic performance level by a whale of a lot. I don't criticize them for that. That's the nature of the beast. But it seems to me if you're going to have ec economic assumptions, you ought to start with updated economic assumptions that are agreed to by all parties so that you're not stuck with something that looked good last year but which is way off uh, uh, since that time. Secondly, I want to know, is that seven years based on the assumption that we're going to be cutting 270 or $290 billion or what have you out of Social Security? I want to know whether that seven-year timetable is based on the assumption there is going to be a tax cut, or are we going to be smart enough to wait in providing a tax cut until we are actually in balance? Not until somebody says that their magic computer says we are going to be in balance, but whether we have actually proven that we're going to be in balance. I want to know whether it's based on assumptions that we're going to have to buy the labor HEW package or something like that, which reduces economic op or educational opportunity for young people. And I want to know whether or not uh, uh, it's going to, we are going to be taking dollars away from poor kids in order to finance a tax cut for rich adults. Uh, I, I mean, we can agree on a timetable provided that we know not just what the economic assumptions are, but what the policy assumptions are. If we don't know what they are, then I'd suggest that this is largely a political uh, device uh, by which people are simply trying to maneuver the president into accepting sight on scene uh, somebody's roadmap without any idea of, uh, of how much gas you have in the car, whether you got enough rubber on the tires to get there, or whether you got a driver who hasn't been asleep at the wheel for the last 10 hours because he's been doing irrelevant things like we've been doing for most of the uh, last two days. So I would, uh, uh, all I would ask is that, is that you. Uh, 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 the very first thing I'd ask, we'd be given at least an hour uh, to analyze what this means, ask the right questions, and see if we can't come up with some, uh, 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 with some constructive uh, suggestions rather than my having to fly in here on the basis of trying to analyze uh, what's essentially, uh, uh, I don't know, hell these, uh, how many pages, uh, 16 pages. Um, with no opportunity to even check them out, uh, especially in a half shut down government. I, I, I've also uh, got a question about, uh, about uh, uh, financing levels here, uh, because I had been told one thing, but, uh, but the text seems to, uh, to suggest another. I had been told uh, that uh, this was going to provide for a 90% rate uh, uh, which would be the number that would be reflected in a clean CR. But now I'm told that for programs that have been zero out in one house or another, that rates is it going to be 60 percent? Is that what's in here? Just what it says, 60 percent. I would suggest it has, uh, 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 I think, significant consequences uh, for uh, 
uh, the low income heating assistance program. I would suggest it has significant consequences for some education programs. I would suggest it has significant consequences uh, for the situation in Israel. And, uh, oh, and uh, I would urge uh, that uh, you reconsider that matter because uh, if we're told this is a clean CR, adjusting down to 60 percent most certainly is not a clean CR. It's a very basic change. Uh, and that is important not because this is the level that will be in effect for two for three weeks, but because everybody around here in both parties, as you know, Mr. Chairman, assumes that that is the starting line for negotiations for the long-term resolution of appropriations questions. Mm -hmm. And if you start with those programs at a 60 percent level, I think you're going to have a lot of trouble. <coughs> well, Mr. Obi, uh, we do have to get down to the floor, so I, I won't uh, answer all of your questions, except to tell you that if you refer to Section 123 of the bill, uh, what Which we are page? providing Which for page? in page 13. But uh, what we are providing for is that so that the president can uh, be able to continue funding some of the programs that he hasn't <coughs> agreed to, to uh, defund like the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation, the Land and Water Conservation, a few others. But let me just say this. Uh, you know, you're Irish, you're uh, Irish, and uh, you're skeptical. I'm Scotch, and we're more skeptical than you Irish ever thought about being. But, uh, you know, you, you ask uh, rhetorically, does anyone believe, you know, all of these things? And I will just tell you that the, uh, the proof is in the pudding. And when you start talking about OMB or CBO or whose figures are right or whose figures were off, you know, who cares what figures are right and wrong? Just stop spending. That's what this is all about. We are going to stay on this glide path to a balanced budget, and we're going to do it by cutting spending, period. Well, uh, I, I, I would guess. just, uh, I would just uh, point to something else, because you, you, you are just critical of, the, uh, of adding these extraneous matters to, uh, to a continuing resolution. And you weren't here. But again, uh, in, uh, when you were here back in 1982, and you were a member of the Appropriations Committee at that time, uh, there were all kinds of extraneous material stuck on a continuing resolution, including a tax breaks for members of Congress. That provision allowed lawmakers to take an increased spending tax deduction of $10,000, and somehow we got to it and we managed to repeal it a year later. That was some of the things that were stuck and in I there. was very active 1983, in 1983, 15% pay raise for House members. We never did get that one repealed. 19, and, and it goes on up, 84, 85, 86, under your uh, leadership, my friend. No, Not you as the no, chairman, but let no. me finish. I didn't interrupt you. The uh, Central American and Nicaragua Democracy, uh, Democracy Promotion Act, that was the Bolin Amendment, <laughs> which just about ruined this country. Uh, and then we could go on to uh, 1991, where we tacked on, which we've been criticized for, an extension of the temporary increase in the public debt limit. And I ask again that this be submitted as a, uh, uh, without objection, for the record. But um, again, I'll just go back to my, my original statement. The proof is in the pudding. Let's see what happens. I think the president will sign this CR. It is more than reasonable. And we'll just have to see what happens. We're going to get this government back working. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, well, yield briefly because we have to move. Let me, since you described uh, uh, some things that happened a long time ago when okay. somebody else was chairman of this committee, uh, let me simply say that uh, I have been used to being in a political minority in this place most of my life. Maybe not a partisan minority, but certainly a political minority. I remember when uh, Jamie Whitten. Um, was having his portrait unveiled in Statuary Hall. And he was giving a speech, uh, and he pointed to Bill Natcher and to me, and he said, you know, I'm happy to see two of our younger members in the committee here today. <laughs> he said, uh, you know, Mr. Natcher, uh, if Mr. Natcher and Mr. Obi both died and went to heaven, Mr. Natcher wouldn't go in until he uh, knew the rules, and Mr. Obi wouldn't go in until he could change them. Uh, so I've been involved in... Uh, lots of arguments around here for a long time. Uh, I don't have to, uh, and I, I don't intend to try to defend uh, what happened under anybody else's stewardship. All I can say is that I chaired this committee for one year, last year. I took over in midterm, and when I did, the very first thing I did was to go to the ranking Republican on the committee and say, look, it, let's drop the partisan BS. Let us simply get together, work out a bipartisan allocation of resources between the 13 bills. That's what we did, 
And as a result, we passed every single appropriation bill on time. There was no need for a CR. Seems to me that we ought to be trying to build on that record rather than being go going back to the good old days when you throw in everything but the kitchen sink. So, so uh, I mean, we can argue about what somebody Mr. did back uh, in 1982. Mr. The issue is what's the right thing to do tonight. Mr. Obi, uh, fortunate for you, you were working with a, uh, with a, with a party, a pre president of your own party. Uh, we wish we had that opportunity. We will next year. Mr. Goss. Mr. Chairman, I have a great number of comments which I will withhold at this time in the interest of time. Mr. Moakley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule that will take care of part of Mr. Obi's pro pro problems. I move the committee strike language. Well, this is not appropriate. Yet. All right. Well, I'm going to move. Withhold? I'm going to move that we strike the language uh, which refers to a balance in the budget in seven years under the CBO estimate because I too believe, as you do, that that's going to uh, make a lot of big cuts in education or environment and other vital programs that will be being cut now. I mean, I, I'm perfectly happy to live under a seven-year timetable, but not if we're going to be adding $70 billion to the exactly. budget as we're being asked to, and financing that out of cuts in education and cuts in low-income heating I, assistance. I, think, uh, I want to know what the policy judgments are going to be that go into that. I think the American public wants to see the budget balanced. I don't think they get, uh, care whether it's done in five years, seven years, eight years, whatever the year is, so long as it's done fairly and it's done in a way which builds opportunity for working people in this country and not uh, in a way which takes it away. Well, but when they mentioned balance under the CBO estimate, you tie the president's hands. If they said balance the budget in seven years, I could buy that without any restrictions. <clears throat> but they are restricting it when they put the CBO estimate there. I, I, I mean, I think that that's a perfectly reasonable position. As I uh, just pointed out, CBO was spectacularly off yeah. uh, just in their estimate of the last quarter. And I would point out that that was an estimate which they, which they made for a time period which is fairly close at hand. We're talking about estimates that are supposed to govern for seven years. Does anybody really believe anybody smart enough to see into the future well enough to know that those are the right numbers? Uh, if there are no further questions from the witnesses on this side, uh, how about this side? If not, Mr. Obi, we appreciate your coming before us as always. We Thank may you. disagree, but uh, uh, we're reasonable people. Nice to be with you. Thank you. This is uh, Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas. Sheila, we would hope that you could uh, summarize your statement. The entire statement would appear in the record. and. Uh, uh, they are waiting, member, many members are waiting down the floor for us, and we want to get down as soon as we can, but you take whatever time you feel is necessary. Mr. Chairman, I am cognizant of the time, and I appreciate the indulgence of the committee, and I will be very brief. I do want to make just one uh, plain, plain statement. Uh, Texans speak plain, and I think it's worth noting on the record that Democrats and Republicans have voted for both a balanced budget, but as well have voted for it in the context uh, of a seven-year plan. Right. I would offer two suggestions and uh, express a concern and, and uh, conclude my remarks. As I look at the calendar that I've uh, noted here in, in writing, as I believe this document indicates a December 5th uh, yes, deadline does. of sorts, or at least a time frame. As I've read my local newspapers, uh, there's a great deal of frustration, human stories uh, about uh, honeymooners who can't get their passports, uh, the closing down of the government. I think the American people want uh, workers for the American government to be working, uh, especially since there are comments in the newspaper that says they'll be paid anyhow, and I, I think that's something we'll have to answer for. As I look at the calendar, uh, even to get us uh, to December 5th, we're talking about about 15 days, and I wonder whether that is actually realistic. I am not sure whether we'll be held in for the Thanksgiving week, but taking those five days out, uh, we're at 15 days. I would offer to say that we move this time to December 13th, which gives us at least 23 days, realistically. I think you need to move beyond the 5th, one, to ensure that we don't have federal workers out and being paid and not working if something happens again uh, where we have not met or not been able to meet a time frame. Uh, and certainly, I think all of us, if we are fiscally responsible, want to ensure that we're not wasting dollars here in the federal government. Let me share with you as well uh, just uh, a, a statement by uh, the editorial in the Houston Chronicle that said this partial government shutdown is an inappropriate and destructive vehicle for focusing attention on a political struggle the American people do not want in the first place. Uh, obviously that can be attached to 
all of us, but I would say partly is that the American people uh, are partly unaware of the debate of which we're having. We need to have, in my opinion, a streamlined and clean CR. And the problem that we have that's already been stated, and I'll conclude with that, is there is confusion or there is not a uh, definite uh, recognition that the uh, CBO numbers are any clearer or will be any clearer over the time frame than the OMB numbers of which have been declared to be partisan. And we still have, in fact, the $270 billion tax cut that seems to jump out of the page on the so-called scoring by the CBO in this last sheet of paper that I'm looking at, which I guess is the 17th page. We still have the potential of the earned income tax credit, which really uh, impacts many of our constituents making under $30,000 as being cut in this so-called scored 2002 balanced budget. So I'd ask, Mr. Chairman, that one, I think December 5th is too short a period of time. I think uh, the American people want to see workers working and the government functioning. Uh, and we frankly have some time element in here that is questionable, whether we'll be in or not for the Thanksgiving holiday. We're all prepared to be here. I think the 13th is a reasonable time. And then secondarily, I would just um, uh, reemphasize, I think, the importance of having a clean CR that does not include uh, the language that ties uh, this um, balanced budget language to the CBO and would appreciate your consideration of those issues. Well, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Lee, we appreciate your coming before us. I would just uh, point out that if the President does sign the extension to December 5th, we are due to return here, I think, on um, November 28th. That's on a Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Uh, and certainly we have time to enact another continuing resolution if the President shows good faith and, uh, and uh, shows cooperation between our leaders and uh, himself. Uh, I think that's going to set the tone, and I think we won't have to worry too much about this. We can then continue with the continuing resolutions uh, as we go along. This one is relatively clean, as you've seen. Uh, there, are, there is practically no extraneous matter in there that is contentious that the President was concerned about before. Well, I, I appreciate uh, your comment on that, and certainly I would think uh, what I've heard from the President is his willingness to get to both the government operating and move right. the American people forward. Right. Um, I do think, and we will disagree, that this is not a clean CR. I'd like to hear the debate as we continue on the floor, and I do think that the fifth puts us a little too close uh, to some of the debate that we may need to engage in and understanding that we may need to engage in and on behalf of the workers of the American of the federal government that December 13th might be a better day. We understand your position. Are there questions from the witness from this side? Are there questions for the witness from this side? If not, Mrs. Lee, we certainly appreciate your taking the time. We appreciate your patience for and having waited you. so long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for coming. The chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule for the consideration of the House without intervening point of order on, of H.J. Res. 122, making further continuing appropriations for fiscal year 1996. The rule provides that the previous question shall be considered as ordered to final passage without intervening motion except one. There shall be one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and the ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. And two, there may be one motion to recommit, which if containing constructions, uh, instructions may only be offered by the minority leader or his designee. You've heard the motion by the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer. Is there any discussion or amendment? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Moakley. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee strike the language in CR before us, which references a commitment to a balanced budget in seven years. We're all aware of the political games that are being played with this continuing resolution. In its current form, the CR will most likely be vetoed by the President and sent back to us because it technically ties his hands in getting to a balanced budget, because this commitment forces him to accept the Republicans' extreme cuts in the education, the environment, and Republican increases in Medicare premiums. This amendment will cut to the chase and allow for the House to pass and the President to sign a clean CR which will keep the federal government running. So let's stop playing games. Let's do our job by passing a clean continuing resolution. <clears throat> Mr. Moakley, uh, you know, when I keep hearing these, uh, these words, political games, political games, you know, that is, uh, is, is rhetoric, uh, which I don't think is necessary. It really oh, doesn't move us towards, uh, towards cooperation, if anything. It, uh, it just gets our, gets our hackles up and our, and our backs up. And, uh, you know, we, if we would drop, uh, just drop these, this rhetoric okay. and, uh, and then make our arguments about it. Let me just uh, give you an example. And I would make this argument about all three of your amendments and then not bother to debate against the other two. But uh, with respect to the three amendments, you know, uh, you're proposing 
uh, that uh, you want to strike the extraneous uh, balanced budget language that we have in ours, and you want to then insert new extraneous language, calling for a new scoring system, something that isn't even out there, not CBO, not OMB, but some other new system. Uh, we just don't need this, and uh, I would hope that we would defeat all three of your amendments and then go down on the floor and make your arguments for or against the resolution. But I, I appreciate the gentleman's sincerity. Okay. Uh, is there further discussion to the gentleman's First Amendment? That's it. If not, uh, all those in favor of the Bokley Amendment will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And uh, the nays have it, and the roll amendment call is not agreed to, and a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Will it? No. Mr. Dreyer votes no, Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Goss votes no, Mr. Leonard. Ms. Price? Yes. Mr. Price votes no, Mr. Diaz-Galar? No. Mr. Diaz-Galar votes no, Mr. Yes. Mr. McGinnis votes no, Mr. Walt Holtz. Mr. Mobley? Yes. Mr. Mobley votes yes. Mr. Bielens? Yes. Mr. Bielens votes yes. Mr. Cross? Yes. Mr. Cross votes yes. Mr. Paul? Yes. Mr. Paul votes yes. Mr. Chairman Sullivan? No. Chairman Sullivan votes no. Clerk will announce the result. Eight to the next amendment. Four yeas, six nays. And the <laughs> amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Bless somebody over there. But before I present my amendment, may I ask the chair, is it all right? Is it correct that Mr. McGinnis always votes before his name is called? <laughs> well, I think he's just anxious. Okay. And, uh, I have an amendment to the rule, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. He's, he's one, of the, one of the newer members, and he you wants to get now, things done. <laughs> Mr. Bieland. I, I, I have an amendment. I ask that an amendment be, be made in order, Mr. Chairman, which would strike the language in the, in the continuing resolution requiring the use of CBO's numbers in determining a balanced budget. Instead, we propose that language be inserted, which would provide the economic and technical assumptions agreed to by both the President and Congress be used in making this determination. I think we'll all agree, people on both sides, that uh, a balance, almost everybody, we have a few hold out hold out on our side, but most of us would agree that a balanced budget is necessary. However, there remain differences, obviously, as how that should be achieved. This amendment, if adopted, would keep the government running, will serve as an important stepping stone toward reaching a balanced budget, but uh, I don't think we should, we should hold up the process by arguing over technical matters. We should do our job, keep the government working, and begin to negotiate on how best to well, achieve a balanced yield. budget, of course. I thank my friend for yielding, and I'd just like to, to speak in opposition to the amendment oh. stating very clearly that in February of 1993, in his first uh, statement that he made before the Congress, President Clinton said that he wanted to use Congressional Budget Office scoring, and we've been reminded of that on several occasions by the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Archer, and uh, he indicated his strong support for that, and all we're doing is carrying forward the request the President made in his first uh, address to us, and I hope very much that we'll be able to do that, and I urge defeat of the amendment. I'm claiming my time, if I may, Mr. 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 Chairman, very briefly. Um, we appreciate your argument, I'd say to my friend from California, and we've heard it made on the floor a number of times in the last couple of days. We're also aware of the fact, it was most recently argued by our friend Mr. Obi, that not only the President, but all of us have noticed, uh, there's nothing uh, surprising about it, that. Uh, that CBO has been off a decent amount in, in, in terms of some of his predictions, too. And the truth of the matter is, as we all know, uh, that it is difficult, as Mr. Opie has pointed out, not only to predict uh, these matters several years into the future, but even, even a year or so into the future. And we're always, we're always off, whether it's CBO, OMB, or anyone else. And my, my, you know, our argument simply is that we shouldn't be hung up over, over whose, uh, whose projections that we, we have to rely on. Uh, if we could get agreement on a seven-year balanced budget, I think we'll all be doing the world a, a grave. A great service. Thanks, Mr. Well, if I could just call attention to Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Dreyer, you were heading up this, uh, this uh, re, uh, rekindled uh, task force on uh, reorganizing the, uh, the Congress. Rekindled? Uh, yes, or whatever it is. And, uh, it, uh, but, it represented a lot of trees. But I'm going to tell you, I think we missed one. And um, if, uh, if the Congressional Budget Office is this inefficient, I mean, why is it there? Are they non-essential employees? I mean, uh, uh, I think maybe we ought to abolish them. And we save a lot of money if this is the case. So let's look into it at any rate. Well, we were worried. We were worried that Mr. Dreyer is going to suggest that, and the president and yourselves will have nobody to well, rely on. Well, I think on. you would have objected to it because uh, we were suggesting it at one point. Well, let's vote on this. We amendment, were talked Mr. into Chair. only to reducing them a little bit. Uh, listen, uh, I think we better move on. Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the Beatleson Amendment will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. And the amendment is not agreed to, and a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. No. 
come you're so late? Yes. No. The clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the resolution? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. I have an amendment to the rule. <coughs> My amendment would add language to the continuing resolution, which would stipulate two things. One, that no tax cut be enacted until the budget is balanced. Two, that no Medicare cuts be enacted if they go beyond what is absolutely necessary to preserve Medicare. Mr. Well, Mr. Chairman, there's... Yield. Go ahead. I'd be glad to yield to Mr. Goss first. Thank you. I, I, if I may, I am extremely puzzled. I just heard Mr. Obie sit here, and I heard uh, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee sit here, and I've heard uh, time and again from your side, we want a clean resolution. And here you are with three amendments adding stuff to the resolution. Uh, that seems to me to be pretty inconsistent. All, all I can say, all I can say is since uh, you have, your side has chosen to make this not a clean <laughs> resolution, then turnabout is fair play. Uh, if the gentleman continue to yield, we have stripped things uh, in response to your request from the resolution, and now you are trying to add more yes. than we've taken out. Well, we offered an amendment, of course, to strip all of this, which you turned down. So if it's going to be in there, then we have every right to add some things, too. Will the gentleman yield? I'd, I'd just like to say that, to me, this uh, amendment is really preposterous because no one, no one is proposing a single cut in Medicare. So I don't see why you uh, are proposing that we proceed with that. If, uh, if you'd like to have that argument, which could go on for an hour, be happy to have it with you. But I think we do need to get, I think we do need to get this resolution. I think we do, too. Uh, if, uh, if members have no further uh, requests for discussion, uh, if we could vote on the gentleman's amendment, uh, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And the amendment is not agreed to, and a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. No. No. Yes. No. The clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. If there are no further amendments to the resolution, all those in favor of reporting the resolution to the floor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. No. And uh, the resolution is agreed to. Roll call. And a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Uh, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Dreyer votes aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Goss votes aye. Mr. Lender. Ms. Price. Aye. Ms. Price votes aye. Mr. diaz Villar. Yes. Mr. diaz Villar votes yes. Mr. McGinnis. Yes. Mr. McGinnis votes yes. Mrs. Wald votes. Mr. Mobley. No. Mr. Mobley votes no. Mr. Bielinson. No. Mr. Bielinson votes no. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Frost votes no. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall votes no. Chairman Solomon. Yes. Chairman Solomon votes yes. Clerk will announce the results. Four days. And the uh, resolution is agreed Mr. to. Chairman. Uh, and um, for the majority. Excuse me. I guess you're looking at me, right? <laughs> and for the majority, Mr. Dreyer will carry. And for the minority, Mr. Mobley will carry. Mr. Mopley. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I'd, I'd just like to say one more time for the record that you said that we would be coming in at 6 o'clock and that this meeting would have us end and on the floor by 6.30, and it is now 7.21. Sure He's talking about Eastern Standard Well, time. let the record show it was not the chairman's fault. Okay, chairman. What about the two-third rule? What about? What about the two-third rule? Not up here. We've already chairman, done it. Do we know about any meetings in Congress? <laughs> we have a continuing, uh, we have a two-thirds rule that took care of all continuing resolutions, remember? Oh, it's yeah. on the floor. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's due up on the floor right now. Can you advise us about tomorrow as to what, what's likely here in the committee? Yes, we... Uh, <coughs> floor. Yeah. Just one second. Don? Yeah, we're all set. Right. Yeah, the two kids we, uh, we will try to uh, give you as much notice as possible. We, we do believe that the, uh, that the uh, Balanced Budget Act uh, will be filed, the papers will be filed sometime this evening, between 9 and 12. Uh, if they are, we will try to schedule a meeting as early as possible tomorrow, but not earlier than, than 11 o'clock, and perhaps even later. So that won't inconvenience you. What is this balance budget? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be very careful. You got to be careful. Uh, 
the committee does stand adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Yes. The House Rules Committee just approving a rule to bring another temporary spending bill to the House floor this evening. The House is in recess. We're going to take your phone calls here in the next several minutes until the House comes in. First call, call Miami, Florida. Uh, good evening. Hi there. Um, I find it interesting that uh, both sides have engaged in some misstatements. I think the political process would be aided uh, if some of the documents were, were available on an Internet site or something like that. At the same time, I'd like to encourage uh, President Clinton to uh, go ahead and sign the continuing resolution. I believe that the balanced budget needs to be done and that it's the best way to go ahead and proceed on that. Thank you. Fort Belvoir, Virginia. I am in the military, in the U.S. Coast Guard, and I am willing to work and serve my country so long as it takes without pay, just so long as the Republicans do not give in to the tyranny of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton should sign this new bill. Thank you. Ypsilanti, Michigan. Hi. Uh, I work for uh, the government in the Ypsilanti Ann Arbor area. And uh, in this area, Mr. Gingrich is known as the Grinch who stole Christmas. What Thank do you, you do for the federal government, sir? What's that? What do you do for the federal government? I work for the VA. And uh, what have you been uh, doing uh, in the days that the government's been shut down here? My regular job. All right. Appreciate your call. Yep. Lacey Washington, you're next. All right. Uh, this is Lacey Washington. Uh, I'm a federal employee who happens to work for a Department of Defense, and I will hope that the uh, politicians are, are able to at least catch some of this program if, in time delay, if nothing else. And I want to express the, uh, my feelings as a federal employee that we're absolutely disgusted with what we're witnessing. Thank you for your phone call. Once again, the House of Representatives is in recess, subject to the call of the chair. They were waiting for...